first speaker is, 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 uh, is she, and uh, she will speak on long-term trends on wage, wage, on wage inequality in China. And, uh, he's, of course, one of the most popular people. He, he's, he's without an introduction on the seems uh, gratuitous in the sense that everyone knows his, uh, his eminence as a scholar of inequality in China. So uh, since I want to maximize his time, I want to learn the uh, floor. Yeah, good morning. Uh, it is the honor for me and also my co-author to have a chance to present the paper. This paper is John Dupin. Uh, very secular, unfortunately, he did not come. He is a woman in the room. We have the division of labor. I will present the part from the income equality series and also the part of the wage and earnings inequality series. Probably you know that uh, in the last three decades, uh, China achieved a very good performance in the economy. <coughs> On the average, economic growth, any economic growth, reached more than 10 percent uh, in the last few decades. So that is a remarkable uh, achievement in the Chinese history. So since the two sovereigns uh, and the uh, harmonious society divisions, uh, China uh, has entered a new policy act. Uh, some more effort uh, to set up with uh, uh, social uh, services or social uh, security systems. Also, the step by step will be covered in a new way with the most comprehensive social program, uh, which is trying to uh, deal with the rising income inequality in China. Also, uh, despite uh, the shift in the policy emphasis from growth uh, to social policy, public policy, and despite the world of the crisis, uh, overall the GDP growth in the past decades uh, was uh, rapidly uh, in the last 10 years, the uh, size of the economic uh, the pipes uh, roughly double. Uh, uh, under this background, uh, we like to uh, uh, answer the two questions. Uh, the first question is that uh, what are the general trends in the income inequality and wealth earnings inequality in China? And uh, just provide some of the best effects. Uh, the second question is that how to interpret the trend with the Chinese specific characteristics. Uh, I think uh, we have all in each country the rising income quality is a reason. It is a specific reason for China. Uh, to answer uh, the first question, uh, we would like to present some regard and findings on the changing income inequality and the income inequality uh, from in our own study, also from my study. Uh, such as, uh, we will present some regard on the national income inequality, uh, rural income inequality, and urban income inequality was an income gap between rural and urban areas. Also some regional income inequality. So I will present uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, results from the previous studies on the webs in the country in China. Uh, also we were yeah present uh, present some evidence on the urban wage inequality and its dynamics over time. 
also uh, like uh, income uh, wedding quality by the companies of ownership sectors and by the different uh, regions. Uh, well, so the second question is uh, we try to interpret the change in income and earnings in quality from perspective of economic development and the economic transition and the public policies. Uh, is the China is a large developing country, also is a country on the economic transitions yeah, from the economy, from the economy, from the market economy. Also try to answer the second question, we try to link this, uh, uh, wedge inequality to the income inequalities that to identify the contribution of the change in the wage inequality to the rising income inequality in China. Uh, this part is to be completed. Uh, let me first talk about uh, the income inequality issues in China. Uh, first, uh, I will say something about the national income inequality. Uh, so, and in the China as whole, the uh, income inequality has recently remarkable, remarkable since the 1980s. Uh, is it by 2007 and 8, the Gini coefficient was about 0 0.49 uh, using, either using you say, chips data or MBS data. Uh, while it was around 0 0.3 in the late 1970s. Even when we use the chips data, we will get uh, uh, an income ratio of top B side to the bottom B side. It was uh, is, uh, 13 times high of the bottom yeah, uh, income of bottom design over the, uh, the bottom, yeah, the top of the yeah, design to the bottom design. And the ratio increased uh, to yeah, 22 yeah, times in the 2007. Uh, this is, uh, is a figure indicating the rising income quality in China as a whole, I would say that. Uh, <coughs> so at the beginning of 80s, income inequality in terms of Gini is around very uh, concerning. Right? It has very rapidly increased in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, it has been slightly decreased in the middle 90s. Then we showed uh, rising yeah, after the middle 90s. Uh, but the <coughs> MBS just published the Gini coefficient in the last 10 years. Uh, from MBS public publications, it was uh, Gini is quite uh, stabilized uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, the argument on that, whether it's, uh, yeah. <coughs> Size or not, uh, some underestimation or not. Uh, anyway, this trend is very clear. The income inequality has been increasing constantly in the last three decades. Uh, you see, if we compare the China with other countries, we will see that the level of income inequality is very high by international standards. Uh, it amounts the top quintile of the countries worldwide uh, ranked by the figure of the inequality. That is, uh, if we rank the, all the countries by the Gini coefficient, we will find the China is on the yeah, uh, top quintile of the, all the countries. Also, inequality in China is near the top of the level in the Asian countries. Yeah. Uh, but some countries, yeah, India, income inequality in India is higher than the China. Uh, but uh, the pub publish the, the data on the income inequality in India is low. That's because we use the 
uh, your consumption as the measure, uh, not the uh, income. Uh, so, uh, yeah, given the rising income inequality in China as whole, we'd like to know the structure the difference. Right? Uh, that means that if we yeah, decompose the total income inequality in the different part, that will be, you see, national income equality can be equal to, you see, uh, the part of income equality in rural area, plus income equality in rural area, and plus the income gap between rural and urban area. Uh, that means we can, uh, you see, go into detail to say, you see, income equality in rural area, income equality in rural area, and income Gap yeah, between the rural and the rural uh, So that is the uh, Gini correlation between the rural areas. Uh, is uh, <coughs> published by NDS uh, that because I use this paper because uh, the data quite uh, consistent. Uh, so you will see that uh, income in quality in the rural area has been recent. Uh, over time, yeah, since the middle uh, ages, uh, since the middle ages. Uh, also, now that it's reached about zero point, close to zero point four uh, in the term of G. Uh, so, how to interpret the yeah, rising income reporting rural areas? Uh, is uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, rising income inequality largely partly associated with expansion of um, equal distributed income from how far the wage of employment enterprise. This is just uh, a TVE, the yeah, township village yeah, enterprise, appeared in the coastal area in the 80s. That provide uh, more opportunity, more is the unemployment opportunity for the parents uh, in their parents. Uh, just because the big bring them back between farm uh, productivity and off farm productivity. So the household are engaged in the non farming activities are really, uh, really the benefit uh, from the income growth. Also, income inequality, yeah, as uh, uh, we showed, that is very slightly, slightly decreased in the middle of the 90s. Uh, this is largely due to the rising in the price of agricultural products. That means uh, rising uh, price of agricultural Culture products will benefit the household engaging in the farming activities. Uh, that will yeah, <coughs> reduce the income inequality within the rural area. Uh, so, in the <coughs> late uh, 1990s, uh, income inequality soon is rising. Uh, but since the 2000s, uh, rural inequality more stabilized, uh, largely due to we see robust growth in income from agriculture. Like, yeah. uh, also, <coughs> due to expansion of migrant opportunities, that like, is uh, uh, employment opportunity for the new migrants uh, spread from the coast area to the west area. Also, uh, it's much related to the policy change. Yeah, since the last time, the government issued a lot of pro-farm uh, policies uh, also provide a more social security program for rural households. Let's come to even equality in rural areas. Uh, so this is also come from NDS, the data. It's NDS, it's a regular household survey. That's a calculate the GE coefficient for both rural and urban areas uh, by using the data set. 
so the trend uh, is also world careers with uh, the rising income inequality. But in the last uh, three or four years, you can be that income inequality was stabilized. Uh, so there are a lot of debate on the weather uh, is the, uh, the data from when yes, reflect actual uh, income inequality in China or not. Uh, so yes, there are some yeah, underestimations in the IBS, yeah, uh, the data. Uh, so largely due to the, the, the subpoena, uh, the bias. Uh, so when we interpret the rising income inequality in urban areas, uh, we will say that it's a more, uh, it's a you know, rapid uh, rising income inequality in the 80s, since the middle 80s, in the uh, 90s. Then the, it's a from middle 90s, another one of the rising income inequality. Uh, so since uh, 2000, some increased, but relatively modest, uh, not so rapidly. Uh, there are several reasons, several explanations. The first is that is associated with income from private business and assets, and um, there's a monopoly industry. So that means uh, this income from this uh, monopoly industry were widened income inequality already. Also, yeah, uh, after introducing some of the public social program, uh, social programs, they were yeah, reducing income inequalities in the area. <coughs> but uh, as I just mentioned, uh, there will be some problem with uh, under uh, estimation of income inequalities yeah, uh, in the areas, just uh, because. Uh, the yeah, sampling bias is difficult to capture the high income group in the service. Uh, that is, uh, but uh, uh, actually we don't know yeah, how my device will be built to uh, something called. Uh, next is for the income tax between rural and urban areas. It was like since the two, uh, 1978 is uh, uh, at the beginning of the economic reform in the rural areas. Uh, income gap in the rural and urban areas decreased obviously that because the rural household income goes through fast than the urban yeah, household. Also from the, you uh, say, the middle, the IT, Income inequality for the reasons, yeah. but uh, it has been uh, decreased in the middle 90s, largely due to rising the price of agricultural products. Yeah. Uh, but since the middle <coughs> uh, 90s, uh, income inequality between rural and urban areas has been yeah, recent. Uh, uh, recent years, uh, it has been more. Uh, uh, so overall, you see a marked increase in the rural and the urban uh, income gap. Uh, you see, in the last decades, you see, uh, in the 80s, uh, the ratio of urban household income to rural household income is about two times. Uh, but uh, in recent years, it reached two or three times. Like this. Also, there's a change in the national uh, income inequality, highly related to uh, urban and rural income gap, especially in recent years. Uh, if you look at uh, the pattern of the rising income inequality between the urban and rural area and the income inequality in China as a whole, you will see the pattern is quite similar indeed. And that means uh, income quality between urban and rural will be the dominant 
will change in the nation in the next part. Also, we uh, did a decomposition analysis, uh, which also tells the same story. That means the contribution of women and rural back in context to the national income report increased since the middle of the 90s. It's in uh, 95, the uh, contribute to about uh, 77, uh, 37 percent in 2002 and 42 percent. Then increased to 47 percent in 2007. Uh, so last uh, okay issues is about the uh, income inequality between regions, the region. Uh, whether is uh, we have with uh, the same pattern on the income gap uh, between region as that in the uh, nationwide. Uh, we, then we calculate, calculate uh, that is the coefficient of variations of the uh, provincial uh, income per capita uh, over time. So it's like, uh, the above line is about the regional income inequality in rural areas. And the below line is in the urban areas. Okay. So that means you see uh, income, the regional income gap, uh, income widening, particularly in the 80s, Syria in the 80s, uh, from the beginning of the yeah, 90s. Uh, so, Regional income yeah, inequalities fluctuated over time, uh, but uh, have no yeah, time of the decreasing, decreasing yeah, uh, trend. Uh, so, some specific features about the income inequality, uh, regional income inequality in China. Uh, that is, uh, regional income disparity is larger in rural areas than yeah, urban areas. Also, regional in income inequality decreased significantly before uh, the, mid the middle nineties. Also, regional income inequality is more stabilized uh, in the last decades. Uh, oh, that is the last part. Household wealth income inequalities. Uh, so we just uh, have the data from uh, yeah, the chief survey in 1995 and 2002 on the wealth information. So we use the data to calculate. Uh, wealth and uh, inequality index trying to see uh, the changes of wealth distribution uh, between 95 and 2002. Uh, our result indicated that wealth inequality was increasing more rapidly uh, during that period. Also, wealth inequality has been larger than the income in the point since uh, and, and in the new the centuries. Uh, the wealth in the point is large in urban areas and that in rural areas. Okay. So let's go to say a table uh, that the table indicates distribution of wealth in both urban and rural area, also in the country as whole, uh, calculate uh, the share, uh, accumulated share for the differences yeah, uh, desires. Also, calculate the Gini coefficient yeah, uh, for rural urban area and for China as whole for the two years. Uh, you will see that. 
probably in the court period, the low area was not so high in 1995, not so high. So lower compared to income inequality in the low area in 1995. Uh, but it, yeah, it was increasing for this uh, 0.4 from 0.33. Uh, yeah, between the 95. Yeah. Uh, it's a slightly increase. But in urban areas, in 1995, GDP coefficient of wealth distribution was quite high. It was about 0.5. Yeah. And it uh, was a decrease slightly between 95 and 2004. But if we look at Gini coefficient of wealth distribution uh, in the China as whole, we will see that there was a big increase. Uh, the large you see, increase is due to uh, the wealth gap between the rural and urban. So, in the Gini coefficient of wealth distribution in like 2002 is about 0.5. But, uh, is higher than the Gini coefficient uh, of income distributions in the uh, 2004. Uh, so that is uh, something I talk on the income inequality. Now I'll give the time to Professor Sao Zong to talk about the wage inequality. Uh. So um, I was talking about the way and inequality uh, after the president's presentation, and uh, thank you for everybody for coming. Of course, um, to understand the income, uh, the wage is a kind of important for all the people. Uh, for example, our study shows that uh, in the early years, in 1988, 44% of the income is coming from a wage, and in 1995, this figure rise to 61%. Uh, okay, uh, so there are also some number from the National Statistics Bureau's, that's in the urban area. And in this part, the age and earnings are mostly focused on the urban areas because there are more data available. You can see from 2002 to 2010, the wage and the salaries are one of the most up well, it's the most important component of the income. Um, in the 2002, it's a kind of 70% of the, it's decreased a little bit uh, in the 2010, but it's still uh, amount to 65%. So to understand in the wage inequality, it's important to talk about the uh, wage, uh, wage and the salary inequalities. Um, for my understanding, all the Wage in in China so far driven by the transition of Chinese economy from the planning economy to the market economies. Uh, there are some key events after China reform in 1978. The most noticeably, of course, uh, the urban labor market did not really start before until the mid 1980s. And then from that, the labor contract uh, first time in China. And uh, then the labor market, uh, you know, Start evolving. Um, in the 1988, actually, there are two big issues. One is the migration become a really social phenomenon. Uh, the people and the news media start to notice that. And also, in that, this year, I didn't write here, is the liberalization of the private sectors. So, at that time, the, you know, the ownership become diversified. Of course, after that, the, the world market economy in the labor market starts transition, for example, included the reform of its own years in the 1990s. Anyway, uh, so those are some big events I just mentioned before. I think all this can explain to the rise of the inequality in earnings. So for, for the, the past experience of child labor market reform, we notice several key points. 
one is, of course, I just mentioned the, the big thing is the labor market transition from part, from planning economy to market economy. And then that's including a law for different ownership. And also a law for the market to set price, including return to education, etc. But another key issue is despite all the trans transition from the economy to the market economy, the segmentation in the labor market still exists, persistent in different dimensions across ownership, across the zoo urban, etc. Um, before the Professor Lee showed you the Gini coefficient of the income, and this picture is the Gini coefficient of earnings in the urban areas, which I take from um, Professor from recent study, which published in 2013. So the data from the 88A to 2007. So the, the trend of the any inequality is quite similar, remarkably similar to the trend of the income inequality. And also the scope, this is just for the urban area. So if we're looking for the same picture for the income, you can see both the trend and the scale of the inequality are quite similar. So to understand the increase in inequality in the earnings, I just mentioned there are several things to, you know, to start with. One is, of course, I mentioned since 1988, it's the liberalization of the private sectors. After that, the ownership become kind of diversified. One thing is the income composition by ownership from 1985 to 2011. You can see from the picture clearly, at the beginning, all the labor force are dominated by the low enterprise and the collectives. But after that, eventually, the other sectors uh, become a big player in the labor market. At the end of 2011, half of the, half of the labor force uh, is one from the other sectors, and the other still from the SOE and the collective. So the employer from the joint ventures, the sectors have become really important. Corresponding to this change of the composition of the employment, so the wage bill distribution, the total wage bill distribution among the whole countries, you can also see the clear entry. Okay. So the top line is the wage bill for the SOEs. It's increasing dramatically along with time, along with the reform. And the wage bill for the private sector and other sectors are increased. At the end of now data, okay, it's almost you know crossed at the end of the years. So both from the wage bill distribution as well as from the composition of the employees, the other sectors play really important roles. Um, the last picture about the ownership, the, the wage and most ownership is the wage index per capita uh, among different sectors. Of course, from the nominal wage, all the, the wage increased a lot because of rapid economic development in China. So if we're taking the 1984 as the base year as the 100, and we can see that all the all, all the, the, the weight in all sectors are increased significantly. Uh, but there's a you know there are little difference. First, of course, the, the weight in the collectives are grows slower than other sectors. The other is at the initially the weight in SOE grows slower than other sectors than the, the joint ventures and the private sectors. But uh, after the 2002 assumption like that the wage growth in the SOE become faster. Okay, this is speed of uh, exceed the other sectors. So one of the reasons, of course, I'll talk later, probably is due to the uh, characteristics of the SOE, which now becoming dominated by the monopoly sectors, monopoly firms. Okay. Along with the change of ownership, the labor contract composition of the Chinese employers also changed uh, dramatically. At the beginning of our data, we can see um, all the, almost all the workers in China hold somewhat stable or long-term job. Uh, but uh, along with the reform, 
uh, the short term and the self employment become kind of uh, important. And uh, the long term contract or the kind of lifelong term employment decrease dramatically. Uh, so after that, because, you know, besides the pure the change in the uh, labor contract, labor relations, and the employment structures, the economic structure in China also changed. Uh, now it is shifting from a uh, polyculture economy to a uh, more you know, industrial oriented economy. All this uh, contribute to the change of the wages. Uh, so, uh, most basically, uh, in, in the following, I uh, focus on the Wage equation in urban China. How exactly the wage are determined in, in, in China um, during the reform? What's the key factors? So I, I think if I have facts uh, in the literature, or I won't go into the data. One is the productive factor, which is called the including education and the experience. And uh, the second is non-productive factor, for example, the gender, the party membership. Etc. The last one is kind of reflect the segmentation in the labor market. It's more institutional one, not the gender one, not the uh, other things. So we are talking two issues. One is ownership, the other is the household registration system in China. So uh, this, paper, this, this, this this figure also comes from the same paper I mentioned before. It's from the most paper. Um, they have really good data. They studied the return to education from 1988 to 2007. We can see, along with the reform of the labor market, one key issue is that the market takes power. Okay, the, the price is of the wage of the, the workers' sake, but the market is not claimed by the uh, government. So we can see that the return to education increased dramatically, especially during the, um, before the 1994. Okay, both uh, the, the three uh, categories of education. Uh, the, the bottom one is the senior high school, and the middle one is technical school, and the top one the three years college and above. You can see for, for all different uh, education, the return of education increased quite dramatically, uh, as mentioned before the 1994. After, after that, um, some part of the return are uh, kind of black out, like the return to the senior high school or return to the uh, technical school. But the return to the education uh, keep growing until the middle, um, until the 2004, something like that. One reason, of course, is due to the expansion of Chinese college. Chinese uh, government expanded the college enrollment in the 1990s, eight, something like that. and. Uh, the figure almost uh, you know, increased by 600% in a very short period. That will have an impact on the weight distribution of the college graduates. Okay. So besides the return to education, the, the price of the workers, the endowment of education of the workers are also increased, the quality. Okay. So one of the main areas, uh, 100,000 people, how many of them have a college degree? Then you can see that the, the number increased dramatically uh, for that. Take the, the, the junior college and at all for example. In the 1990s, the number is around 1,400. But the, at the end of the data, it's almost become the 9,000. So it's increased dramatically, both for the price of the education and also in, for the endowment of education. Is that this is not only the, 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 the level of education, also the variance of education also increased. So the variance of endowment, also the return of education increased, both contribute to the increase of earning inequality in China. Uh, for, 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 for the other non productive sectors, which, there are a lot of studies in the literature on the gender, also in the party membership. The general consensus is that there exists a Big difference along the gender dimension as well as along the party member dimensions. Uh, so, for the market segmentation, I focus on two, two issues. One is ownership. Of course, the, the, the which differential between different ownership exists for a long time, and uh, some funding found that the gap are decreasing. Gap are de decreasing if we only looking about the, across the ownership lines. But 
law, the, the, the new thing is the, the, the segmentation not only, you know, divided along the permanency, but now it's more along the cognitive sectors and the monopolistic sectors. And in China, almost all the monopolistic sectors are concentrated, are dominated by the state of enterprise. So one study by Yu Ximing and Li Si and the secrets are presented here. You can see um, this is the 2007 data, I think. Um, okay, so we can see that a large portion, almost more than half of the wage differential between these two sectors, the non monopolist sectors and the monopolist sectors cannot be explained by the uh, observed characteristics. Uh, so this is a uh, big issue. And the, the other dimension of the segmentation job in, in the labor market is that in urban China, there are people with local Kuko and also there are people with non local Kuko. Most of them are low urban migrants. So for that, there is also a large degree of segmentation, both in terms of the return to education and also in terms of the how much money they earn. We can see first from this, this uh, uh, table it's clear to see that uh, if we compare urban native as the people with local Kuko and the migrants as the people without the local Kuko, the wage differential are quite large. Okay. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, the migrants earn about 60 to 70 percent of the earnings of the local peoples. Uh, interestingly, uh, if we're looking at the income among different groups and the also income trend across times, we can we see the urban they keep and the migrants they keep from 2002 to 2007, the, the trend are kind of different. Of course, there, there's some issue on the data, yes, especially for the migrants who are not really uh, that, that great, but uh, at least from the data we can see, for the urban natives, they would see an uh, increase in the inequality of earnings. But for the migrants, the trend is at least unclear, so we will see some green Um So let, let's summarize because uh, some people told me the time's up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we see that uh, the first income earning, the income increase a lot. Uh, we also uh, want to see what's the reason behind that. Of course, we identify mostly is the reform, is the economic transition, and uh, that will change the employment structure and also the uh, price, how the, how the wages are setting up in, in, the, in China labor market. Uh, Another thing we want to do, but uh, we didn't really think yet, is try to bring the, the income the way to see how the large the contribution for the wage equality to income equality. And uh, another thing we didn't say here is that I just mentioned uh, most of any wage equality are present in the urban China because urban China have a more data, uh, more um, reliable um, materials. But we will try to you know, expand analyze the uh, zone chan as well, and then we we'll take a whole picture because um, from the, the, the data structure in China, the earnings in low China is not really um, reliable and easy to construct. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first discussion. Uh, to discuss this paper. Uh, it's my pleasure to read the most updated uh, descriptive results and analysis uh, from the most uh, prestigious <laughs> people working in this area. Uh, so the, the, the key points of this paper are three, mainly. One is um, we have seen the dramatic rise in income and um, income and earnings uh, inequality. <coughs> and that goes without saying the level has levels of both uh, a level have of both variables have gone up as well. Uh, the second is they didn't emphasize in the in the presentation, but uh, is this process is periodically improving. So uh, there has been a tremendous reduction in poverty rates. And the third one that's very interesting is that uh, the rise of inequality seems to stop 
in recent decades. Um, and they do they don't give a comprehensive uh, reason why. Um, but but we think that the expansion of higher education and uh, the change in demographic stru uh, structure that has reduced the supply of those good workers there being responsible. Uh, I there are some details I'm not going to spend too much time on um, to to people. Uh, one might be the urban rural income decomposition. You want to think about how the change in boundary between urban and rural over time contribute to some of these differences. Because the rich towns over time they become part of urban and they're not no longer part of the rural. So how you um, come to that? I mainly want to focus on these two topics. Um, should we worry? about inequality and what aspects, um, what should we worry about? Income, the inequality is a big deal in China. It's a very hot topic. And the government has been discussing ways to redistribute. Uh, the news report says that some government scheme is coming out, but we haven't seen what, is, what uh, that is. So what, um, why should we worry, or should we worry? Uh, we worry if the, uh, if the inequality is due to unfairness. People here, they don't like uh, inequality, but they, they don't hate rich people who got rich because they're capable, they're, uh, they work hard, but they, they really resent people who got rich in a, from an unfair way, like officials. Um, people really hate the officials. So, um, so they hate <laughs> their, <laughs> but yeah, that's true. If you rent a big pig official, then people think that's but he must be corrupt. And then also the monopoly list. So all, all these social instabilities that we think are harmful, <laughs> that, that the inequality, uh, the, the uh, unfair inequality, I think most of them is due to the un un these factors. So do we know how much inequality is unfair? I think the answer is not much. Um, uh, we've seen a Ohaka Flinder decomposition that, that decom decomposes Income gap into explained or unexplained parts, but we know the unexplained parts are not solely unfair parts, right? And then there's a there is a Joy Murphy Pierce decomposition method uh, <coughs> that decompose uh, um, the inequality into an observed observed part, mainly educational experience, and unobserved ability, uh, such as. Um, and that's defined as residual state, but um, can be, you can think of that as non-cognitive ability, uh, but also some unfairness there. <laughs> so unobserved, but, uh, well, I haven't followed the literature much in recent years, but um, I don't think that does the trick as well. It's, it's the unique part of the, of the, the inequality in China is there's a lot of unfair, a lot of corruption in that inequality. So can we, do we have, I'm asking our lecturers here, is there a way to separate out the unobserved ability uh, into something that's justifiable and something that's not? And also, <laughs> And also, um, uh, as we've seen, wealth inequality is a lot bigger than income inequality. A lot of the unfairness actually goes into the wealth, because income you can observe. A lot of the uh, corruption takes the, the way buying a house is cheap, right? Uh, that kind of wealth transfers between businesses and government. So examining wealth inequality more 
more carefully and do some kind of decomposition if possible would be more fruitful. And the second uh, aspect why um, inequality is bad uh, is the unfair endowment in productive characteristics. Take education, for example. Education, we, we always think is the explained part, right? It's the fair part. But it's the education gap itself may be unfair. As we know, there's a big finance gap between urban and rural schools, and urban children, uh, migrant children don't have access to urban schools. So they lead to education gap. And then, um, as I heard uh, uh, two days ago from as Heckman's talk, there's also a cognition gap then that may arise due to artificial um, policies. For, for example, migrant children, when they have to be left behind, be taken care of by grandparents, their cognition, uh, cognition may be hurt. And, and these tend to solidify uh, the intergenerational um, uh, inequality, so make it maybe harder for people to accumulate human capital. That may that um, uh, that that may be in response to the inequality and will have an impact of reducing inequality in the future. So the policy choices, uh, being here about income redistribution, and uh, there is also a, a uh, justification for wealth redistribution and curb corruption, that's what the, the current government is doing. And also, uh, let's talk about is the, the unequal access to schooling and employment. Um, that, that should also be part of the policy choices. And uh, there are also some pro-rich pro policies that we should examine. For example, we're talking about income inequality income redistribution, the focus has been how we collect taxes from the rich people, but less, inten less attention has been paid how much, on how much, how the money is spent. So the government spending programs are, are not, their money is not spent on the poor people. If they're spent on the rich people, then it doesn't, does not reduce inequality. For example, education system, healthcare, uh, taxis, taxis are, are, are used by rich people, and, and also the tax used to raise salary of, social, uh, of civil servants and civil servants are the hardest job in, in China. And also social insurance policies <coughs> is also pro-rich. Um, uh, children of poor migrant, poor farm families, if they come to cities and they, they pay um, uh, into the Go a pay as you go pension scheme, then the money is used to uh, pay pension of uh, more affluent urban parents. So these are the policies that deserve attention. That's all. Okay, first of all, let me say, um, it is really an honor for me to read this paper. Um, although I'm Chinese, but um, I don't know much about income inequality in China, so I got really educated about it, and I enjoy reading this paper. Um, so this paper um, made the contribution to, um, to enable us to uh, deepen our understanding of inequality in China. So it makes a thorough investigation into various data sources that are available out there and presents convincing evidence that income and wage inequalities have been rising over the last three decades in China. And it suggested various chan channels that have contributed to the rise of inequality as well as policies that are meant to reduce it. Um, so because this is a really, really recent paper, so um, me and Professor Zhao um, didn't have the luxury to, co um, to coordinate about the content we're going to present. 
Uh, on the other hand, I feel really um, relaxed or I feel good about it because some of my opinions are also shared uh, by uh, Pro Professor Zhao's um, opinion. So I know I'm not talking some things totally stupid. <laughs> um, so I, this talk, I will be focusing on uh, some possible ex extensions of this work or some possible different um, angles to look at this paper. So perhaps I'm just presenting some of the results that are out there in that paper, but in a different way, okay? So first of all, this we can categorize in, in inequality in, uh, from two different but interrelated aspects. So the first thing is just covered by uh, Professor Zhao, it's um, fair inequality and unfair inequality. And the second way to look at it is short run and long run, or inter intergenerational uh, inequality. So what is fair and what is unfair? So fair inequality are the inequality workers of higher productivi productivity are paid more. And um, for example, they might have higher education and skills or cognitive abilities, and they might be better motivated and they might be more persistent. And these two aspects are, um, in most cases, um, interrelated. And unfair inequality, instead of thinking about corruption, um, I'm very naive. I, um, so I'm not going to talk about politics. And I think the unfair inequality, from my view, are workers of the same productivity are paid differently, and people are faced with different opportunities. For example, there might be discrimination against migrants and their um, children um, by the famous hukou system. And that might be unbalanced resource allocation across various regions of China. So, the first categor uh, categorization, fair inequality, is productive. Well, it rewards workers who have already made more investment in their own human capital, and they should be paid more, why not? And also, it provides incentives for workers to get more human capital, to become more productive. So for both reasons, fair inequality is good. On the other hand, unfair inequality is counterproductive. Well, if the opportunities are unequal, it, um, to, to, uh, the opportunity to obtain human capital are unequal, then it directly prevents the disadvantaged population from becoming more productive. That's a direct effect. The indirect effect, if the pay payment system is unequal, then it just provides these incentives for the disadvantaged workers to become more productive. The second categorization, short run versus long run. So short run inequality is an inequality in a cross section. So it could be fair or unfair. And long run or intergenerational inequality it is mostly related to the unfair inequality, i.e. it's due to the unfair uh, or unequal opportunities. In particular, the unequal access to education. So then because of these two categorizations, we could have some policy implications. There are policies that directly target inequality. For example, income redistribution, progressive taxation, minimum wage, default system, etc. And the effects are most likely to be in the short run. And they contribute to the stability of the society, but 
not necessarily economic growth. And there are policies that target the roots of inequality, in particular the unproductive and unfair inequality. So those are provide equal opportunities at the micro level. For example, relax the hookah system. So facilitate worker mobility, equalize payment between equally productive workers. At the, um, and also provide equal educational opportunities for migrant children. And provide financial aid for students from poor families and enhance access to educational loans. Those are at the micro level. And there could be equal opportunity at the macro level. What I mean by that is more balanced resource allocation across regions, in particular the investment in the supply of education. As we see in the paper, the uh, regional, dis uh, regional inequality is very large in China. And there, this policy is already going on. The government is giving some policy, uh, poverty uh, alleviation and development uh, policies. So these policies have not only the short run, but more importantly, long run effects on reducing inequality, as well as boosting the economic growth. So um, some future work, I think, um, the, to me, I think the most interesting and most important future work might be try to develop a well-funded uh, well micro foundation because it is necessary for policy evaluation, especially for policies that have not been implemented. That is because Individuals would react to policies by changing their behavior, in particular their investment in their own human capital as well as the ch uh, investment in their children's human capital. And firms is also an actor in this market. They will react to the government policy by changing their hiring and their investment uh, decisions. So the final outcome or the effects of the policies would depend on how these micro decision makers make their decisions and how their choices are interrelated. Therefore, for these reasons, I think a micro foundation is um, necessary and important. Um, just to conclude, um, I don't think there I can come up with better conclusions um, than somebody who's sitting in this audience. And let me just borrow his work uh, without noticing him, uh, notifying him. Um, so this is a work by Jim uh, in 2005. This is what he said. So inequality is not to be feared. Making people more skilled is not socially harmful. Enhancing skills raises the productivity of the nation and makes more resources available to society at large. And he also said, human capital is the asset that ultimately determines the wealth of China. Fostering access to education will reduce inequality in the long run. Thanks, and particularly uh, thanks the person who I borrowed ideas from, <laughs> without <laughs> defining them. So I think, yeah, uh, because their comments uh, remind me of other work, other papers, and that really 
Transactions go on informally, and lots of lots of you know subsistence farming activities uh, where you produce for your own consumption. Essentially, leave no trace of the data. Um, so, uh, do you? Ha how important is that? How important is the bias that that introduces for the rural inequality numbers in China? social assistance. Well, well, the fact that the, the fact that there's a lot of economic there's a lot of what we would call economic transactions going on that yeah. we never see, right? That they're never because. For the reasons that I mentioned, right? Um, so you know, uh, for example, uh, if, if you if you if you if you had a farmer who was fortunate enough to be able to produce enough to supply his own needs, and he lived entirely off his own needs, you would never see that in your data. Yes. yes How do you yes, see yes, it? I mean, that's so my that's my question. Yeah, what, yeah, would yeah. you talk a little bit about the surveys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want I want I want to understand the framework. That is, yeah. is it? The survey of the income or consumption. Well, the consumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, right. the consumption, the include. Right. But the, and yeah. the income. What? Yeah, the income, subsistence income. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They consume. Yeah, they produce. What do they produce? Right. How are you measuring it? It is use market. Yeah, price. So yeah, you just the survey. Just ask the quantity. Right. So what kind of data are you looking for? Yeah, yeah. 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 Of uh, the uh, agricultural products mm. they produce, uh, then use the uh, market price uh, to get the value. Mm -hmm. And is, uh, you rely on diaries? Or? Yeah, we rely on diaries. Yeah, we have right. a very detailed diary on that. I, I don't know much about the China numbers, but I do know about some. Okay. Yeah, we're talking about that. They're kind of shaky. So I take uh, just a couple more, okay. and then I'll go okay. first. In. <laughs> um. I, I really enjoyed the uh, presentation, but uh, also I started uh, two comments. Uh, I started working mm -hmm. in terms of what should we worry about yeah. in equality and what we should worry about, and then fairness and unfairness. Yeah. So my sense is, is I'm our economist. If we define fairness in the sense, yeah. uh, if we pay worker according to its productivity, then it's fair. We don't need to worry about it. Yeah. But uh, from a gender perspective, working mother's perspective, I want to talk about the sense of fairness. Because based on time use survey, we just presented a paper yesterday. China has a very unique feature, is both men and women and working on full-time basis. Women work, spend as many hours on paid work, and the men, right? A primary aid working woman. 
and uh, particularly in the uh, manufacturing sector, 45% of uh, workers are uh, women work a very long time. And uh, in the low-end service sector, 52% of uh, workforce are women. They work an almost identical number of hours on top of that. And then they take a uh, majority of the uh, household work, take care of children, take care of you know, all these things. And then we see the, that the differences that uh, Gary Becker says, the time allocation can, uh, under full constraint, time constraint, energy constraint. Because a woman spend <laughs> like so much time to housework, so we find the gender wage decomposition without taking care of the differences in the time spent on domestic work and the, and the, the timing of the housework is, is done. You know, women do right around the clock, right before <coughs> they go to work, right after work, and during the lunch hour, male worker go to take a lunch break, female worker go to cook uh, lunch, and then <laughs> take a bath, <laughs> and then woman go back to work, right? We decompose all these differences. They can uh, explain nearly like 27% of uh, unex uh, like gender wage gap. That's according to productivity, but it's fair or unfair. Should we care or not care? That's just my question. <laughs> 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 uh, so very, uh, I'd like to just, to just to make these are more kind of general yeah. comments. So I'd like to have Albert go ahead. Uh, I'm going to make a comment. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in the wealth in quantum results because you, you talk about how it became greater than income inequality. Which you use. But I think any country will see, in general, much higher wealth inequality than income inequality. So actually, the relative closeness of the two numbers in China. Interesting. I mean, yeah. to suggest that wealth yeah. inequality. Yeah. So I'm curious how you think about that yeah. in the international. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I, I want to echo Yahweh's. But in the, I just want to echo Yahweh's kind of final thought that you know this is. I think a lot of the action is how does the income inequality contribute to the dynamics of wealth inequality yeah. as we go forward. Uh, I think there are a lot of interesting issues about the distribution of wealth that are quite unique. Uh, okay, let me, if I, if I may comment a little bit, is uh, first I think uh, uh, the, the data, right, the data needs lots of work. The NBS data, uh, let me comment one thing about NBS data, which uh, Professor Lee uses that when they calculate Gini coefficient, one thing NBS did this time when they released the Gini coefficient for the rural China, and, the, and this gentleman mentioned that is uh, they actually calculated virtual rental as a part of the income. So, so for the rural household, uh, they're, 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 you know, they, they, there's almost no market. So when they own, most people own their houses. So NBS calculated how much that house is worth in terms of the rental in you know, the rental market, and put that as part of the income. And uh, this actually is quite is quite unusual uh, in terms of the calculating income. But then we did it this time when they opened up. No, no, they, when they opened up the when they when they publicly released the data and they they described the detail in terms of the Gini coefficient this time on uh, January the, the calculate. So Professor Lee mentioned this about the. Uh, Wealth inequality. So wealth inequality in my data is much larger than income inequality. So uh, if I remember correctly, it's about the Gini coefficient for wealth inequality is about 0.7 or something like that. I didn't uh, uh, 0.7. And uh, but but that compared with the income inequality, a uh, 0.61, and the consumption inequality a uh, 0.55. So that's the that's basically was the was number. Uh, but there's a quite bit of the. I think it's it's great. It's good into it, it's it's good thing that there's a quite bit of the debates right now going on in China about data quality. About the, I think the uh, beta has a data. Professor Li has a data. I have a data, and the CTSS, uh, Zemin University has a data as well, and many more data set. I hope will emerge, and hopefully, uh, in the, with in the in the comparison with MBS data we make this uh, a richer and more quality data 
you know, for, for the research purpose. That's my comment here. So I'm going to uh, arrogate the right to the last comment. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that both the discussants raised fairness issues, but I actually want to disagree with the, uh, uh, the way that fairness has been articulated uh, for two reasons. First, um, if I said to you that it is just for uh, ability to create income differentials, that begs the question of how it, it generates the income differentials. So in other words, if the smartest person in the United States was paid $11 trillion a year, that would be uh, consistent with uh, the statement that a relevant variable uh, is generating the inequality, but we would, of course, challenge that that's the appropriate uh, allocation associated with, the, with it. So the first point is that arguing that certain variables are just sources of inequality doesn't, that leads to the second question, which you know, the actual translation is one that we think is just. The second point is, uh, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of current political philosophy in the United States, uh, Ability differences would not be considered to be a source of just uh, inequality because an individual is not responsible for ability differences if they're literally just a matter of genetics, for example. So metaphorically, if it's the DNA, you didn't choose your parents, the genetic lottery, you win, that doesn't give you any claim on it. Now, uh, okay. yeah. well, there's an issue. So the limitation of that approach is there's a difference between being responsible for something and deserving something. And that's the distinction between saying, I don't pay somebody half as much because they're female, because they deserve it if they make, engage in productivity, versus saying that the productivity differentials are not a matter of choice. Now, in my view, this is important, actually, for interpreting rural inequality. So if I, here's one way to think about it, is you suddenly open up opportunities for participation outside of farms, and so some people exercise them, some don't. If I said to you that it's merely more ambitious people that did it, one would probably conclude, leaving aside issues of how ambition evolved, that that was just. People make choices, and this is the inequality that results from it. On the other hand, if I said it was genetic and predetermined random ability differences, that sounds less just. And so I think I use, and I, and I said most political philosophers would actually come down on the side. There is a difference between inequality via choices, inequality, inequality via uh, exogenously determined attributes. So I, I just would urge you to see, to think through how one can do decompositions that are focused on the distinction between choices, predetermined characteristics, and that I think will give a better leverage for the, uh, the, the uh, distributive justice issues that you're, uh, you're bringing up. So I know we're running over time, that's why I said I was going to take the last comments so, uh, so, so that, so that the uh, moderator wouldn't shut the uh, speaker up. Uh, thank you uh, to the, uh, the author and the discussion.